in dealing with trauma right. in dealing with trauma and sorrow. So the hadith that we were working on last time and still working on right now is Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. I believe last time I said al-huzun and that's actually not accurate. It's al-hazan, not al-huzun. So a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-jubni wal-bukhl wal-jubni wal-bukhl and the reason why I wanted to focus on this hadith I mentioned before is because when we're speaking about trauma, when we're speaking about sorrow, when we're speaking about so many different psychological pains and how they can disable us from being able to do our day-to-day -day life or even live, um, live in a stability to be able to do the different things that we uh, are required to do. So we talked about ilham and ilhazan and ilham, we said that it's basically the different sorrow that you might have as a result of a past trauma, ilhazan is a direct uh, sorrow or sadness that may be as a direct result of a certain trauma, sorrow that, or even calamity that you might go through. In bukhl is when a person is greedy. In other words, they're fearing poverty. So they would become very greedy. So they would hold on to the money. In jubn, on the other hand, Il Jubn, on the other hand, is basically uh, cowardice, and the person loses their uh, their courage and their bravery to do what is necessary because they're basically living in fear. And the fear that they could be living in could be fear of death, could be fear of a consequence or a consequence that they're focusing on, which is an evil consequence. Dila um, Iddain is basically the 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 debt that one might actually fall into and how they become enslaved to that particular person or at least to that particular um uh, to that particular debt that they want to cover. Ghalabat al-rijal is when the person is overcome by the people that surround him. And here, yes, it is men, but it's it doesn't have to be just men. So all the different types of uh, overcoming by people is ghalabat al-rijal. And what I wanted to focus on was really in terms of this hadith, how would actually put in ilham, ilhazan, ilhajz, ilkasal, and why all of that? So when you look at ilham and ilhazan, you're talking about an inner trauma. Ilhajz, ilkasal, you're looking at the body. Is it a disability or is it losing the ability? Ilbukhl and iljubn, is it the fear of poverty or is it the fear of other consequences that's making and acting as the barrier for the person from doing what is necessary, from acting in a noble act, or basically the different, the different, let's call it financial incapabilities, because they have to pay a lot of debt. And then they feel that they all of a sudden are enslaved by other people, by whether they become uh, kind of like a pseudo slavery type of thing to that money that they had borrowed, or whether it is overcome by people or by men, or perhaps by uh, the crowds that surround them. And then they become uh, not necessarily lacking the ability, but they become with all this community that surrounds them, they become weakened. And we talked about this hadith last time and how the Prophet ﷺ was making this dua, how Abu Umama was one day himself sitting in the masjid and he just he was just feeling so traumatized in so much sorrow and so much pain that the Prophet ﷺ told him, whenever you would wake up we, or even you would um, get into the, the evening time, make this dua, this dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hazan, wa a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal, wa a'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl, wa a'udhu bika min ghalabat al wa qahr al-rijal. And he said, I've done it. In other words, I tried it and it actually worked. Now, one thing 
that we did not yet talk about, which is, yes, we talked about the different types of trauma and how it affects the person, but we didn't talk about the hajz and kasal and so forth. But it's really important to just go over and just recognize how trauma and sorrow not only affects you, but it's actually part of us being human beings. It affected the prophets before us, affected prophet Ayub when he had actually faced the harm and the trauma due to the illness that he had that he was um uh, facing and of course we talked about prophet Yaqub alayhi salam how he was facing the sorrow and the trauma from losing his son and we talked about the prophet how he himself was facing all the different anxiety on the inside and how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him i want you to look at the glory of your lord almighty and you sujood in order to help you reduce the anxiety now i want you to see I want you to see all of these different examples in the first um, episode for this halaqa because it's really important that we don't go back over every single thing that we had done before. And we also talked about this hadith, and um, there's a lot to say in regards to this hadith. This is actually one of my favorite hadith. And we talked a lot about, well, why is it nasiyati biyadik? So we did cover that one. Please go back to uh, that video. But here's one thing is that, yes, the hadith were definitely telling us that the place of healing the trauma and healing the sorrow actually starts from faith within. It's basically not changing what is outside because guess what? Changing what is outside is definitely not within your scope. So what you need to do is change how you feel about it. Change how you feel about the force and the power that is capable of changing all of that that surrounds you. Which is why the focus is Let the Quran be the spring of my heart because when the Quran is the spring of your heart that's when you will recognize the light within your chest and how it will wash away the different sorrow that might actually be inside in other words to change what is around you is really by starting in Allah the lord almighty does not change what surrounds you unless you change what is within so don't expect people to change because you're just angry or sad about them you just change how you feel about it you just change how you observe it you just change the relationship between you and the world that surrounds you from thinking that the power is within the outside to recognizing that the power is by Allah almighty which is a very important thing to say because during our times, there's always this trend of believe in yourself. In Islam, it's not believe in yourself. It's actually believe in Allah. And that's why, let's look at this hadith. Allahumma rahmataka arju. That was the dua that the Prophet ﷺ had actually called uh, da'wat al-makroob. All right, da'wat al-makroob, which actually means the invocations of the person that's going through trauma, calamities, sorrows, all those different things. What did he actually teach us to do? Allahumma rahmataka arju. Fala takilni ila nafsi tarfata ain. Wa aslah li shakni kula. La ilaha ila ant. Let's look at the wording of this hadith because it's really sad how many times we can repeat a dua and not recognize what the words are actually saying. In other words, we need to go and delve deep and deeper than the surface of the words. So here the, the hadith goes, Allahumma rahmataka arju. O oh Allah, I ask you and I seek your mercy. I want you to focus on this one because the person is going through trauma. This person is asked to seek and say, O oh Lord, I ask you for your mercy. When you say, I ask you for your mercy, you're letting and shifting your focus from focusing on the pain 
to focusing on the mercy to get you out of the pain. So who are you seeking the mercy from? Not from whoever's harming you, not from the situation, but you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the mercy, for the change. In other words, it's collecting your dignity, your honor, not to surrender, not to the situation, and certainly not to the people. Who do you surrender to? You surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. فَلَا تَكِلْنِي إِلَى نَفْسِي طَرْفَةً the word فَلَا تَكِلْنِي is extremely important because when you say فَلَا تَكِلْنِي, it's like, don't let me seek refuge or even, or even depend on myself, not even in a blink of an eye. Wait a minute. Why not believe in myself? Why not the hadith telling me to believe in the powers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given me? And give myself the ability to make a blink of an eye. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, yes, I recognize that you recognize that you don't even have the power, not even to give yourself the blink of an eye. And that's why the people that have leopardess, they actually end up getting blind, not because there's something wrong with the optical nerve, but that's because they're not capable of recognizing recognizing that they have to blink. So they end up getting so many different things within their eye socket that it eventually starts drying up from all the different tears or all the different moisturizers that are actually within the eye socket. So they eventually lose their eyesight. Now, here's the thing. If they were responsible for every single blink that they were going to do, imagine how much focus that's going to need just to blink their eye a couple times, more than 30 times every single minute. Imagine that. So that's why you would make the dua and at the same time recognize that even with a blink of an eye, you don't want to necessarily believe in yourself, but you want to believe in Allah Almighty. I know that the supporters of the word believe in yourself, they would say, well, don't understand it as a like a verb, uh, ber, verbatim type of thing or literally believing in yourself. But when you look at the wording, I know that there sometimes would be a metaphor, but the believe in yourself actually comes from an Asian religion, believing in yourself in where you're believing in your own powers. Believing in your own powers is more of what Asian religions actually teach. It's all about letting you re Vive the ability, how much focus you're capable of doing. And that's why they actually do martial arts. The martial arts was all about bringing in this focus, this collectivity in your focus in order to hit the target and be able to hit a specific target by recognizing the focus and the ability to focus. And that's why they would use the word believe in yourself. And later on, the different psychology departments and different psychologists, they basically had embraced a lot of the different ideologies or a lot of the different therapies that the Eastern religions were, were practicing. And then they took it within those psychology departments and started practicing and preaching it like it was the therapy as a replacement for taking away religion and God out of the whole uh, the whole treatment within psychology. In other words, it was really taking out God in the, from the picture and replacing it with human power or replacing it with matter and replacing this is really because most, and in fact, psychology departments are more controlled by atheistic lobbies and now with the LGBT lobbies and giving you a new narrative. So we really have to be careful about that. In Islam, no, it tells you don't put yourself in 
uh, delusion, thinking that it's all about you. Now, this is not telling you that you don't have the power or that you don't recognize the powers and the potentials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you. It is good to recognize the potentials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you. And it's definitely important that you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you the intelligence, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that created you fi ahsan taqweem. So therefore, you just need to put the effort and believe in Allah. Because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the actual force behind the world, is the actual force behind everything in the creation from the expanding space and to the small atom on earth or even smaller than atom. So that's why the Lord Almighty asked us to actually swear and recognize the magnificence with what we say and what we don't say in the quran karim it's basically a word of a magnificent lord almighty the quran revealed onto us that was mainly talking to us about Tawid. so if you look at the quran in where there are 6236 ayahs only about 700 are actually speaking about legislature but the rest are actually talking about the Lord Almighty. In other words, redirecting that, yes, behavior is important, but recognizing the power of your Lord Almighty from this, the farthest space to the smallest space that is recognized or not recognized on earth is basically controlled by the Lord Almighty. So what do you recognize then? You recognize So don't be responsible. Don't make me responsible. Not even to myself. Not even with a blink of an eye. And make me or make all the matters for me. All of them get into where they should be. In other words, you you putting the effort is definitely something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. But that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to focus on the matters where they are heading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illa ant. O Lord Almighty, there's no Lord worthy of worship but you. There's no deity worthy of worship but you. I want you to look at the word ilah. The word ilah, scholars have differences of opinions on whether the word ilah actually comes from walaha or whether it doesn't even come from the word walaha or alaha, but it's actually in itself what is called the jamin. In other words, it wasn't even a conjugated word, but is actually in itself a noun that was not a conjugated noun from a verb. Now the word walaha, if it is conjugated from the word walaha, would actually mean what you adore and what you love most. If it meant that it is alaha to mean what you regard as the deity, in other words, what you worship, all these different opinions are actually considerable opinions to where the word ilah actually comes from. Does it come from what people worship? Does it come from what people adore? Or what? Or does it actually in itself actually mean in itself a god in a deity which includes the, the, the rest of what was mentioned? At the end of the day is that when you say la ilaha illa and you're recognizing that your utmost love is supposed to be the Lord Almighty. Your utmost submission should be to the Lord Almighty and that the deity that you worship it should be the Lord Almighty. When you look at the word la ilaha illa and it takes you into redirecting your focus into a complete definition of Tawheed. You're recognizing the presence and the existence and the essence of the Lord Almighty. You're recognizing that the Lord Almighty is the only one that you submit you submit to in worship. And you're also recognizing number three, which is that your utmost embracement of all the powers that you seek, which is you're seeking his mercy, 
you're seeking is love, you're seeking all the different names and attributes of the Lord Almighty is only to be for the Lord Almighty. At the same time, the Prophet ﷺ was always teaching, and this is extremely important, that when you teach your family, when you teach your children, take the time to teach them what it means to embrace Tawheed, what it means to embrace looking at the trauma from looking at it to looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the force that is capable of changing it. Let's look at this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ had combined his family. In other words, they got, he gathered a family. And he said, إِذَا أَصَابَ أَحَدَكُمْ غَمْ أَوْ كَرْبٌ فَلْيَقُلْ Allah, Allahu Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. He said, if any of you are going through any calamity, let them say, Allah, Allah. Why Allah? Allah, two times, because it's wanting you. Instead of yelling it out, instead of screaming it out, let you ventilate by saying, Allah, Allah and not breaking plates, not trying to go to these areas where you're just screaming and yelling and trying to break plates and etc. Islam is giving you the right keys. The reason why you are seeing people going through probably breaking their own body, cutting their own body, or probably breaking plates or what, or screaming, or even smoking, or probably going on drugs, etc., is because they're actually seeking through the different ways of getting their dopamine up. And this is extremely important to recognize because they're trying to ventilate, but then in Instead of recognizing that the power that changes their ability and changes the situation that they're in is really insane. Allah, Allah, they go and seek the materialistic thing. They try to ventilate by letting the different pressures on the inside really just trying to break it out on the different things around them. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ also taught us, yes, Allah, Allah, Rabbi, my Lord, la ushriku bihi shay'a. I don't associate partners, any partners with him almighty. When you look at the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us that whenever you would get angry, instead of getting it out on the different matters that surround you, but that you actually need to make wadu instead. Al-Ghazali explains that the reason why you're making wadu is really to cool down the heat that had now been pumped with a different increase in the high blood pressure. Yes, he didn't use the word blood pressure, for uh, of course, but he was basically giving a sign of increased blood pressure in the body in where he was using the word that the pressure in the body being pressuring on the head and the body and, and so forth and the heart. So he said doing wadu, sitting down, if you're sitting down, lying down in order to reduce all the different pressure that is in your body. What are you doing? You're taking a physical action and you're also taking a spiritual action by making wadu and making this dua Allah Allah Rabbi now that what should we look at the word Rabbi and not Ilahi clearly not Ilahi was used the difference between Rabb and Il Ilah we explained the word Ilah the word Rabb actually means the one that is the Lord the one that is responsible for the different matters that surround me? So here you're basically turning and saying, Well, Los Frontale is responsible for me. And I don't associate partners with the Lord Almighty in where I don't seek any type of help or any type of a, any type of provision from other than the Lord Almighty. So you could see where the Prophet was even telling. Don't 
do not want me to teach you words whenever you're in a calamity to say. And he said the same exact thing. Allah, Allahu Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. Always teach your children instead of looking at the calamity and turning into drugs or turning into drink, drinking or tr turning into getting it out on the people around you. Learn how to make it and let those words redirect your focus. Allah, Allahu Rabbi, wa la ushriku bihi shay'a. Here's another hadith. Now, why are we using the du'as in order to help us explain these, um, uh, this, this trauma lecture? <laughs> trauma lecture, yeah, that'll be a good one, huh? <laughs> why are we using these du'as? Because it's not just a du'a in where you just kind of repeat it, then yeah, I'll just repeat it. No, it's something for you con to contemplate on. It's something for you to delve deep inside and recognize how are they going to affect how are, am I supposed to redirect my focus? Let's see this du'a. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anna laka alhamd. La ilaha illa ant. Wahdaka la sharika lak. Al-mannan. Badi samawati wal ard. Dhul jalali wal ikram. The Prophet Sallam heard a man making this du'a. And the Prophet Sallam commented and he said لَقَدْ سَأَلَ اللَّهَ بِاسْمِهِ الْأَعْظَمُ أَلَّذِي إِذَا سُئِلَ بِهِ أَعْطَى وَإِذَا دُعِيَ بِهِ أَجَبْ He said, commenting on the dua that this Sahabi had done, he said he had invoked the Lord Almighty with his magnificent name, who, whoever would invoke the Lord Almighty with it, he would be given what, in other words, had this dua answered, and he would be given what he's requesting. Let's look into this dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anna laka alhamd. O Lord Almighty, I ask you, for you are the one that is the controller or all the praise goes back to you. Wait a minute. So why are we saying all the praise? Why the praise? I'm already feeling sorrow. Why don't I just talk about the sorrow that I'm feeling? And just to complain about the different things that I'm feeling. That's okay. You could actually say, You can complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like this, that just like Prophet, uh, Prophet uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. Or that was Prophet Yaqub. All right. So, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anna laka alhamd. O oh Lord Almighty, I ask you, because all the praise is due to you, what is it doing? It's redirecting your focus from looking at the trauma to looking at praise, to looking at good things. And that's why even in Surah Al-Fatiha, you would repeat Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most beneficent. You're taking a time to do it again and again. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You're starting with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Starting the praise in where you're taking the moment instead of counting the things that you are thankful for. No, you jump directly because the, the things that you can count are too many, are numerous. So what you, would you say? You would start with recognizing, O oh Lord Almighty, in other words, all the different things that you had given me are definitely a lot more than what I could count. So you directly go, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All the praise is due to the Lord Almighty. Why? Because it wants you to direct your focus on the blessings that you have and not the things that you're missing. Don't look at what you're missing. Look at what you have. If it works, that you would write down perhaps all the good things that you are granted, all the good things that are functioning well with you, rather than the things that are not working well, in order to for you to redirect your focus. There's no deity, no love, no Lord worthy of worship or any Lord 
or any love or any power or any deity, but you. You're the only one that we don't associate partners with you. Al-Manan. I want you to look at the word al-Manan. Because al-Manan, to give al-Man is to give bounties. To give al-Man is also many times when we would do men, it's also to brag about something. So are we bragging about something? No. It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that deserves all the praise, that he deserves all the recognition of every good thing that is happening well in my life. He's the one that, rec that we should recognize as the one to be responsible for it. So that's where Ur Manan comes in. He had created the skies and the, the galaxies and the heavens and the earth in the most perfect way. In other words, when you're recognizing that what is even more sophisticated than the human creation is basically and definitely a lot more expansive than the human creation, which is all these galaxies that you would you would definitely not be capable of even having the idea to fathom and and even understand what it means to know that some of these stars are millions of years of not millions of years, but light years away. That's beyond any human ability to just imagine. So you take the moment, Ya Allah, you are the one that perfected the creation of the heavens and the earth. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram, the one, Dhul Jalal, the one that is the Almighty and the most magnificent. I want you to look at the word Dhul Jalal because Dhul Jalal, it's like he is the one that had, that was that manifest his his um his power, his magnificence. It's all manifesting upon everything. Well, Ikram, and he's also the one to give not only manifesting his power, but also manifesting his goodness in everything. What is you look at the part about goodness, the power, the perfection of creation, perfection of everything? What is that redirecting your focus on? It's telling you, listen, if the Lord Almighty was capable of perfecting even the heavens and the earth. And he was capable of perfecting and giving the bounties and the blessings to everything that surrounds you. From the expansive skies to the smallest thing, then to your Lord Almighty. And as the Lord Almighty, shift your focus to recognizing the good things that you have. La ilaha illa and. The Prophet in this dua and commenting on this dua of Prophet Yunus, the Prophet was telling the Sahab, Would you not want me to tell you if a man were to go into any calamity or any harm in any matter in this life, there is a dua. Would you want me to tell you of a dua that would bring an ease to all the different calamities that they're facing and he said it's the dua of the noon it's the dua of the noon which is prophet yunus alayhi salam what is the dua la ilaha here comes the word ilaha again la ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimin there is no again ilaha no deity, no love, no uh, power, but the Lord Almighty. There is no deity, love, and power, but to the Lord Almighty himself, except you, Allah Almighty. Subhanak, 
all the glory. Nothing less like unto you, O Lord Almighty. In kuntu mina valimi. In ni kuntu mina valimi. I was amongst those that had wronged themselves. What is that wanting us to recognize? That the calamities that you could be facing may actually be as a result of something that you had committed. So should I just focus on figuring out what wrong thing I might have done that probably projected the situation that I'm in? You may, you may have done something that you did not even recognize. Yesterday, I was asked to do uh, a question. Well, I've done istighfar, and I've been doing istighfar all the time. Why do I have to keep on doing istighfar? I've done istighfar every single time. I made a mistake. I made istighfar. Why do I have to still do it again? Let's look into this. When we make istighfar, it's not only in regards to a sin that we, that we might have committed. That's one reason, definitely. To seek is still far, to seek forgiveness, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness is basically most of the times because you had committed a sin. But that's not the only reason why. Let's look into two hadith. The Prophet used to make istighfar. And the, the question of the Prophet and asked him, why would you make istighfar when you had been basically one your sins were all basically forgiven all the sins that you had committed or to commit in the future and he responded should I not be thankful for the things in other words be a thankful servant for the things that Allah Almighty had blessed me with what is that putting us into that's hadith number one let's lay it out like a, we're doing a math problem here this is hadith number one let's go for hadith number two when you enter the bathroom you're actually not you're not permitted to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you're doing your business in an act of nature in the bathroom but that's actually one of the most important times that you're recognizing that if you weren't capable of doing your business in the bathroom that that's actually one of the most important times that you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely needed in that situation, but you don't actually say it. You, in fact, you're asked not to say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you leave the bathroom, you say, Ghufranak. What is Ghufranak? I seek your forgiveness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one that, that told me and asked me, not to even mention his name. Why is he asking me to repent for a, for a sin he asked me to, to commit? No, it's not a sin that you committed. By not mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that in itself is actually submission to the Lord Almighty. By not praying, for example, for a woman that has her cycle, she's actually getting rewarded for not praying. She's rewarded for not praying. Yes, she's rewarded for not praying. Because if she were to pray, she would actually be at sin. She would be at sin for praying. Yes, yeah, she would be at sin for praying. Why? Because the main idea is the submission to the Lord Almighty. So is that a sin? It would be a sin if you were to pray. Not a sin if you were not to pray. So what is that recognizing? So it's, let's put the first hadith that we talked about, the second hadith, and the third hadith together. Or the, um, or the, the third matter. Now, what we recognize within all of this is that that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted us to recognize that His bounties are so magnificent that if you were to think that by submitting to the Lord Almighty, that that's actually equivalent or in order to compensate for the blessings that he had given you, you're, abs you're actually wrong. The submission that you do, whether in prayer or whether in any good deed that you're doing, it's not actually to compensate for the blessings that Allah had given you. 
his magnificence, his blessings are far more than what you could actually think for or count for. So what do you do? You say Ghofranak. You make istighfar in order to not only seek repentance, and seek forgiveness, but you make istighfar because you're recognizing, you're taking a moment to recognize that the bounties of the Lord Almighty are far more and a lot more than what you could actually count for, or even think that by making a small obedience that you're compensating Allah for the for the gratitude or for the for the good things that He had given you. And that's the same thing for a woman. Yes, you might actually want to pray. You might want to fast during your cycle, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you not to do it. So that submission of you not fasting and eating during Ramadan is actually worship. It's worship. It is worship. And that's why Sayyida Aisha, based on the hadith that was when Mu'adha actually asked his Sayyida Aisha, and this hadith is actually authentic in the Bukha and the Muslim. And the Sayyida Aisha was asked, why are we ordered to make up our fast and not make up our salah? Sayyida Aisha responded, Aharuriyatun anti. Are you from, what is al Haruriya? Haruriyah is basically, it's a city in Al-Iraq that was known to having al Khawarij. al Khawarij were really embracing thoughts and, and very similar ideas like today, ISIS today. So Sayyidah Aisha was telling her, are you part of these people that are from the, this extremist uh, city? And she said, no. So Sayyidah Aisha responded, well, during the time of the Prophet Kunna we were ordered to make up our fast, but we were not ordered to make up our prayers. In other words, this is basically to tell us that submission in itself, Allah Almighty, is actually the ibadah itself. It's the worship. By not praying, you're worshiping Allah. <coughs> now the other part which is part of that main dua I know we kind of got off because we were doing Allahumma na'udhu bika min al ammi wal hazan and Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al ajzi wal kasal Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al jubni min al now I lost it min al jubni and what is the, the rest of the dua I got I totally got lost min al jubni wal bukhl min al bukhl wal jubni Sorry. Um, so here, when you look at the other part in this in this dua, so al-ajz and al-kasal, and then you've got ilaj al khawf You've got there's the part in where the person is living al-bukhl and al-jubn, al-ajz and al-kasal. To change the fear, there is the part in where al-ajz and al-kasal. Al-ajz is when you're disabled from doing something disabled from doing a particular move. You don't have the ability to do it. Il kasal is not that you are physically disabled, but you're actually losing or you, you lack the ability to do something. Now, when you look at this part, it's extremely important because you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you the power, whether the physical power or whether the enthusiasm on the inside, or for you to recognize your potentials and not feel that you lack the power. Most of the times, it actually comes from fear. When you look at fear, it's part of human nature. In fact, without fear, we would not have actually created the civilizations or let me call it, made the civilizations that we're in. But there's a positive fear and that there's a negative fear. The fear that motivates you and pushes you to seek security, to seek a change, to motivate you to do the right thing is actually a positive fear. Fear 
is what made us build the different civilizations where if it wasn't our fear of the different things in nature, we would not have actually built, arch built architect or probably built the different things. If it wasn't fear of illness, we would not have, or fear of death, we would not have actually studied medicine. We would not have went to schools. We would not have done any of that. If it wasn't for our fear of poverty, we would not have actually went into getting a job and making a difference because we're afraid of hunger and so forth. So there is a positive fear and there is a negative fear. The negative fear is when you let your fear of whether we're speaking about poverty or whether we're speaking about acting in nobility, when you're afraid, if you were to implement any noble act or any principle that the Lord Almighty asked you to embrace, when you're afraid of an evil consequence, rather than recognizing the, the, uh, the reward from the Lord Almighty. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, that even when Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was redirecting his fear. So here Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says right there, فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفَ يَتَرَقَّبْ He was in fear going around within the city. خَائِفًا He was afraid. يَتَرَقَّبْ He was on the lookout. And he was also in, in fear when فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Inside Musa, there was fear when they actually threw all the different magic right before their eyes. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ Don't be afraid. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى And this is one thing. Teach your children. Don't be afraid. Sometimes you've got to speak in power and say, don't be afraid. You can do it. Don't be afraid. You know that you're on the right thing. Be proud of your Islam and speak in power. And this is also sometimes you have to actually speak to yourself and actually say, Allah is with me. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, even during the time of the Battle of Uhud, when they said, when they said uh, that Hubal is the is the highest, and they, they looked at the Prophet ﷺ and said, What should we say? And he said, oh, tell them, Allahumawlana wa la mawla lakum. Tell them our Lord is our authority. Our Lord is the one to give us victory and you have no one to give you victory and no one that you regard as your place of authority. So what do you live? You live in embracement. You would say, Allahu Mawlan. You're talking to yourself. You're taking it a moment where you're doing that therapy. Don't live the fear and don't focus on the fear, but you speak to yourself and say, I am not afraid. I am strong. I am uh, holding on to Allah. Allah is the one that gives the power. Allah is the one that gives the, 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 the ability. Allah is the one that gives the intelligence and so forth. Why? Because it's redirecting, redirecting your vision to recognize this power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why that moment when Prophet Musa alayhi salam was, was, was in that fear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, he said, Qala la takhafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't be afraid. Innani ma'akuma asma'u wa ara. I am with you. I'm capable of hearing and seeing everything. Why? Because you're not the only one that's seen it. But the Lord Almighty is capable of seeing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of hearing everything that goes on in where don't feel lonely. Never feel lonely. And remember, your fear should not be the people. Your fear should not be the job. Your fear should not be the money. Your fear should not be the reputation of how people might actually speak about you if you were to probably, you know, act in your Islam, etc. And this is really common in many cultures and in many situations where people are afraid. What are people going to say about me if I were to wear hijab? What are people going to say about me if I were to probably, you know, practice a certain thing in Islam? What are people going to say if I don't dance with them? What are people going to say if I basically apply anything or certain things in Islam? What are people going to say if I, if I don't apply the same school that everyone's applying to, etc.? 
It's all about fearing people. Don't fear people. Act in nobility. Do what is noble. Do what is right. And hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let your fear be only coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from the people. Life is too short. So what you what you should always recognize that the true place of fear is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't fear people. And remember, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once that place of fear is changed, that's when that's when you'll be capable of redirecting your vision. Therapy in healing, sorrow, and trauma. One, recognizing the blessings that surround you. That's why even those that were in Jannah, Alhamdulillah. What do they say? Who are the Mu'mineen? They would say, Alhamdulillah, the one that took away al hazan that took away the sorrow, that took away, did they say that took away the, that took away the calamity? The calamity is there. They didn't say that took away the calamity. They said that took away the sorrow. The calamity was there. They were patient. What does it mean that they were patient? What it means that they were patient, the calamity was there. But they basically endured and were capable of enduring by not succumbing to the situation. So if, for example, you get a flat tire and you start swearing that you got a flat tire and et cetera, and you lose your morality at that time and you start using all those, all those uh, words and all that swearing and all the yelling and et cetera. That's not acting in patience. That's losing patience. Why? Because acting in patience actually means embracing nobility and principle embracing nobility and principle despite the calamity you're working on fixing the calamity but the calamity did not result in you losing your principles but you still maintained it someone harmed you in a certain way you still maintain your principle and this is, this is extremely important it's all about maintaining the principle and that's what it means to endure. Whether you're maintaining the principle of courage or the principle of hanging in there, not cussing and not using, you know, bad language or whatever it is, but you're actually enduring the pain, letting it somehow go and take its course by you trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you fix the problem what do you do you recognize the blessing alhamdulillah inna rabbana laghafurun shakur ghafur why are we going for ghafur right now and why shakur so ghafur basically means the one to forgive so why because most of the calamities that you go through are actually a result of something that you had committed and not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, something that you might have committed in the past. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically, when you look at calamity, the Prophet said, Inna Allah idha ahabba al -mu'min If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his servant, he would put him in calamities. Isn't that a word of discrepancy? How is it that if you love someone, you put them in calamities? It makes no sense. So this is how it works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he loves the servant, he doesn't want them to taste the punishment on judgment day. So he would give them some challenges in this dunya in order for them to endure the challenges in this dunya 
rather than the punishment in the hereafter, because that's going to be far more painful and a lot more harsher than actually the pain that you will get in this dunya. So if you lost your loved one, just remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting you into these different stages of different sorrows because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you it's kind of like closing so many doors on you in order for you to only go to one door and that is the door of Allah Almighty. You close up all the other doors because the more doors are open, the more likely you will just keep on opening a door, going inside, opening another door, going inside, and going into a maze. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes up those maze, those entrances to those different mazes that are dead end in order to make you go to one direction. What is it? It's following the right path. Following the right path in order to guide you to make the right decisions and getting the feeling of confidence. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we had told them who was Adam and Eve. Come down out of the Jannah. Yet, they definitely got out of Jannah, but it's a place full of fear and full of sorrow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now you're out of Jannah. Now, if you were to get any guidance, just recognize whoever follows my guidance, they're the ones that are not going to face the fear or even the sorrow. Why? Because the sorrow, the sorrow is going to be taken away when, look at this, الحزن, when the person is redirecting the focus from looking at the pain to looking at the Lord Almighty. So what happens? It redirects their focus from looking at the materialistic things that surround them to looking at the force of the Lord Almighty. But that is the power to bring about a Jannah. Wait, 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 what Jannah? Now, I want you to look at this ayah because this ayah was actually really speaking to Prophet Adam السلام, and Hawa. But here it said, Jamia. Yes, because that's going to include also his children. When your Lord Almighty had taken from the children of from the back of Adam his children, and he made them a witness upon themselves. Am I not your Lord? Said fairly. But we don't remember any of this. I don't remember Allah telling me this. Did you think that memory is only in what? Your frontal lobe or what your th thalamus actually remembers? Did you think that realities are only what your brain remembers? How much do you remember of what your ancestry had? You don't remember much of it. In fact, your body actually contains all the data that you have no information about. All this data is actually, is actually stored in your DNA. You have no memory of it whatsoever, and not in your brain. To think of to think of data as the only place stored in your memory is definitely very narrow in understanding what makes of data. Data is not only what is stored in your brain, but data can also be restored in your heart, can also be restored in your DNA, in you without you recognizing. So that's why that ayah, am I not your Lord? And they said, verily, you are. When on judgment day, you will just say, we were pacified away from it. What is pacified? Pacified is when your focus is actually going the wrong place. 
again with the word focus. Fault is on entertainment, on getting more of that dopamine, on getting more of that nourishment, on getting more of entertainment, more praise, more compliment, etc. All of that, that's a lafla. You're just focused on what's making your body at that moment getting you some form of happiness. It's a delusion. And that's why they said, غافلين. we were just غافلين. What is الغفلة? الغفلة is when your focus was actually on the wrong thing. And this is extremely important because when you relate it to this area, it basically tells you, listen, yes, when you were in Jannah, you were feeling the tranquility, you were feeling happy. That's what Jenna is all about anyways. It's feeling happiness on the inside. But once they were out, it was, they were left to themselves. Make the decisions. But the decisions to get to that happiness as a human being, we basically work because we're really hopeful that by getting a job, by getting money, that somehow I'm going to get a better home and get a be better degree by getting a better degree. And then we start losing our focus from the tool to the goal. The girls, they would get married. If only I would get married. And then she would go into a depression right after it because she always thought that the marriage was going to be the goal. She would get a degree and then she would go into a depression because she thought that that getting a degree and was a goal. It wasn't a goal. Your degree is not the goal. It's a tool. Your marriage is not a goal. It's a tool. Your job is not a goal. It's a tool. All of these are tools. Your children, having children, they're having a house, buying a house, whatever it is, a car, whatever it is. All these different things are tools. If you think that by getting all these different provisions, that they're basically going to grant you happiness, you've got it wrong. Which is why we one of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in the, the, the statistics and how many people are getting anxiety. It's basically one of the main reasons is basically because we actually are living in khawf, in thuzun. Why? Because we're away from huda. We're away from guidance. When people are away from guidance, there's, it's not a surprise why people are getting more of anxiety and more of sorrow and more of depression. It's not a, a surprise at all. Not a surprise because when they're not following the guidance, they're going to be left to their own potentials and their own potentials will basically fail them because we always make dua once you actually think that your potential is the power to make a difference and you recognize that your potentials are weak and not necessarily that strong to change the world around you that's when you start feeling i'm gonna lose hope because my potential is not actually as to how powerful people are telling me it is. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you right there. Those that would believe in our, but that, those that would believe in those that basically the Jews and the Christians and the Zoroastrians. If they were to believe in Allah, judgment day, and act in piety, they will get the reward. But most importantly, they would not feel the, 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 the anxiety, the fear, and they would not feel the sorrow. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Bala. Man aslama wajihahu lillahi wa muhsan. Verily. Why? It's like, it's an objection. Verily, the one that really submits their face. So it's not talking about the face as a literal thing, but this is actually using the face as a metaphor. You submit 
the face, the metaphor is all your senses, your mind, your your face, your what, and all of, all the different things that your face contains, what you look at, what you what you hear, what you say, all the different senses. The most important senses are actually in the face and in the head. So what do you do if bala? Verily, this is an objection. Absolutely. And verily, those that submit their faces and submit their senses to the Lord Almighty while they're acting in righteousness, those are the people that are weak are going to be getting their reward from their Lord Almighty, and they will not be feeling the fear or the sorrow. Again and again, so many different ayat are really emphasizing this idea, this fact that it's all about taqwa and to actually act in piety, to act in hidayah, act in guidance. Those are the ones to actually be away from all of that. We'll continue next time, inshallah. It's always just remember redirecting your focus and taking the moment to recognize the power of the Lord Almighty and his blessings. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I'd be happy to answer any questions, although my slides are not finished. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Inshallah, we'll continue next week. Rahima, go ahead, Rahima. I, I tried uh, Rahima. Did she leave? Okay, yeah, she's gone. If, if, there any, if there's anyone else that would like to um, ask any questions, I'd be happy to answer the question, inshallah. I'm not sure how this is done, but yeah. All right, well, assalamu alaikum. I don't see any questions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone, and barakallahu feekum.